and uh, we will uh, introduce you this presentation which is pre-recorded that's mean that uh, we have already recorded the presentation and you will be uh, watching it take into consideration that you if you have any question you might write it down on the chat and we will we will recap those questions at the end and provide you if we can with some answers otherwise we will send them to the uh, to the conference speaker who might uh, answer to you by email so um, this conference will be 30 minutes long and um, please Kate if you can just launch the record thank you Okay, thank you so much for joining this session. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, with uh, Minalogic today and uh, with my, my dear friend Ron from EdCam. Um, we are, uh, our intention today is to tell you a bit about uh, how we're trying to rebuild the future uh, from the Bay Area, uh, from, from San Francisco, um, and, and how we are using innovative framework and innovative innovation strategy uh, to help major companies be successful in the future and in a longer term perspective. Uh, so very briefly, uh, myself, I'm Mathieu Agues, I'm the CEO of School Lab here in San Francisco. Uh, School Lab is an innovation studio that has been around for 15 years um, and we're doing uh, education, consulting and startup acceleration activities uh, in three continents, uh, including obviously uh, US and San Francisco. Uh, so I like to start with kind of the problem we, we, we found out, uh, you know, in, in our um, current world, where I believe it's really urgent to think about, you know, long term, to have um, a, a deeper sense of, of what the world could look like in the future. If you look, you know, at basic facts such as, you know, our, our modern democracy are, are ruled by presidents that are elected for four to five years, depending on the countries, and they usually set the agenda for that length, um, which means they're driving a country in a very short term perspective. And when you look at companies, it's pretty much the same thing, especially the listed companies um, that have to do quarterly report and, and always have to overperform the previous quarter. So they really have a very you know, short-term vision to buy quarters. And, and I think the COVID crisis just showed, that, uh, just showed us the, the limit of this very short-term vision and short-term um, activity. And it's definitely urgent to have a much longer uh, perspective on, on you know, what are, what are we doing uh, today and how we can, um, uh, you know, build a better place, basically. Another important thing is that we are living, and it's not a scoop, uh, in a very exponential uh, world uh, where things are going extremely fast and where, you know, the impact of, of innovation and of disruption um, are getting extremely intense. Um, and just, you know, to take very, two very basic example, you can look at what happened in the, in the transportation in the taxi industry where when Uber took off, and same thing for the autoing uh, industry where Airbnb uh, arrived on the market. It was, it was really a big boom uh, on those markets. And it's really key for uh, existing actors to, to be prepared, to anticipate the changes and to be part of those people who are changing the industry instead of, of, of just you know, staying still. For those reasons, uh, we uh, have been developing for the past six years uh, at School Lab, but also in other you know places in the world, other actors have done the same. Uh, develop you know innovative frameworks such as design fiction, and the aim of design fiction is to help people to develop their foresight thinking uh, and to really be able to you know open the radar and and look really further away and have a better sense of what the future could look like. So again, design fiction is something pretty new. I think it's not as popular and as, as theorized as could be design thinking, for instance. Uh, but it's definitely something hot that uh, we'd love to share today. So basically, what is design fiction? Um, you want to see it as a process. Uh, process could go anywhere from one hour to six months, uh, but it's a process with you know different steps, pretty easy to digest and to use by, by any companies or any organization. This process allows you to generate disruptive concept. And, and, and when I said disruptive, I mean it. It's not about incremental innovation only. It's really about disruptive ideas. Uh, but it's not only about having ideas, it's also how you put it to action. Um, and so design fiction is a way to, to, to create new services, new product, and a strategy that would allow you to be uh, a leader in a market uh, in the next five, even ten years. So the, the essence of, of design fiction is to say it's impossible to predict the future. There is no way anyone here in this room can tell me exactly where we would be in five years or even in six months, you know, with the, the COVID crisis and certainties everywhere. Uh, but it's definitely possible to imagine different scenarios of, of a possible future. Uh, and when you start combining all the scenario and put it next to each other, 
you start you know thinking seeing patterns and you start identifying where the future could go and so therefore you can anticipate uh, how your industry shifts and, and how uh, things may evolve for you so um, to, to make it more clear in terms of the process um, so there is those five different steps um, the first one is foresight city and for those of you who are familiar with design thinking it's, it's a bit what you will do uh, on the customer discovery side um, design thinking meaning gathering some material, getting a better understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and here we're really thinking about you know, the problem of the future. Um, so it's, it's an intense uh, moment to really gather uh, trends, weak signals from the future uh, in order to create you know, those material that would, that would be used as, as a basis for, for the next researches. Once you have the, done this foresight study, you want to you know, embody all those materials, all those insights into fiction. Uh, why fiction? Just because the future is not there yet, so it has to be fictional. Uh, but basically, the aim of the fiction generation is to create media, to create artifacts where people can really immerse themselves into these possible uh, futures. Once you've been immersed, once you've been exposed to the future, you can start, you know, brainstorming and have very innovative concepts coming. Um, that's the third step. It's really about creating those very disruptive concepts and, and, and ideas that would then lead to a strategic roadmap. The strategic roadmap is really key. It's actually, okay, if I want to be there in five years, what are all the steps I have to take before that? And how should I start transforming my company right away today to be a leader in, in the world of tomorrow? The strategic roadmap is also a very creative exercise um, that really helps people figure out what's going to be the next step and what's going to be the first step they can take right away uh, to anticipate this, this possible future um, and to be proactive on that. How you can use this fiction? I see three main ways, three main avenues to, to really you know, take the best of, of this design fiction process. The first one, which is probably the most obvious, is you can use design fiction to imagine tomorrow's products and services. What would be your offer as a company in five years? Um, but another way to use it is to try to anticipate the impact of a new technology or new usage. Um, probably some of you are, are, are familiar with the, the TV show uh, Black Mirror. Um, and they're doing a fantastic job on that sense to really try to anticipate how you know a new technology or, or a new habit may have a bigger impact later on. Um, and so this can be used on a, on a less dystopian way. Uh, for instance, for startups, uh, startups are trying to get investors on board by you know showing the potential of their technology of their company. And so this animation could be used uh, to help startups you know uh, create a world where their startup might be successful and therefore to attract uh, more investors and help them figure out you know, where they want to go and what's the vision. And the last way to use it is actually to foster team. And that's something which is very important right now and you know, a time of uncertainty and, and you know, again, the COVID crisis has just you know, magnified uh, that, that, that fear for uh, the future. Um, and so if you can run a good design fiction process, you can help your team figure out how the future could be. And therefore, the, you reduce the level of uncertainty and you help them prepare themselves for the best and the worst of the future. And at least you help them you know, come together and, and create confidence together uh, toward the future. So that, that's kind of the last way to, to do it. So now to make it a bit more concrete, I'd like to, to show you a few use cases um, about how we've done it. Something you know, very, very easy ones, um, just so that you can, you can see uh, the flesh of, of these fiction when it's put to action. Um, the first thing I'd like to show you is, is actually a question that I have a lot of time, which is, is there any link between you know, design fiction and science fiction? Um, and yes, there is. Uh, science fiction can be, can be used a lot for, especially the foresight study, when you try to, to figure out how people have already tried to experiment to think about the future. And you can see here just a few examples of, of you know, science fiction movies that we've used for um, a, a project in the future uh, of mobility and try to figure out how people may be using cars in the future. Uh, and so you can see different, you know, different examples of how science fiction have, have you know, uh, tried to show us the interaction we have with the car and what would be important and the kind of new technology that we have. So that's kind of you know, fun part of the design fiction process is try to see you know, what we already have on the table that can tell us about the future. I would like to, to dive a bit in, in some of the applications that we've done. So, at Full Lab, we've done design fiction for about six years. Um, we have you know, dozens of projects, probably around 50 projects we've run uh, with different companies. I've just highlighted five of those, and I'm going to deep dive in, in two of those. 
Uh, but just to show you, you know, how broad it can be and, and how much we can, you know, tackle uh, important problems. Um, so the car, for example, about similar biodiversity with retail industry, I'll, I'll go into details in a second. Uh, another retail company, Leclerc, where we try to design the retail experience for growing elderly population, which is actually, you know, something key for um, a retail company today, and, and it's, you know, something that's going to get bigger and bigger. Um, Visa, also, I'm going to, I'm going to, you a word about it, but it was about, you know, initiate a new carbon currency. Uh, Total, uh, very, very big group, very healthy, I mean, it was healthy at the time, and they were still, you know, worried about what if our cars are becoming electric cars? What are we going to do in terms of, of services? And what are we going to go, what are we going to do with our gas station? And so we had them figure out how they can, you know, shift from gas station to service apps, uh, leveraging their, their actual uh, position in real estate. And the last one, which I, I think is very interesting also, is one that we've done with the, the Cabinet du Premier Ministre um, in France. Um, and it was actually about imagining the future of handicap and how our society is going to cope with handicap people with transhumanism. Because let's imagine we have, you know, bionic arms and all that, that superpowers allowed by technology. What, you know, are going to be the, the role and the, and the, the, the space for handicap in our society? So that was a very interesting um, project we've done also. So let me just show you very um, with, with pictures like what it looks like um, using, for instance, a car, for example. Um, so we've done that in, in November 2017, and basically the idea was to help Carrefour figure out how the major trends they're pursuing inside their stores will have an impact in the future, and is there any guidelines around you know the way they should they should promote those new trends? And one big trend is obviously organic food, nourriture uh, bio. Uh, and, and, you know, the organic food has been raising for the past few years uh, really tremendously. And it looks like something fantastic for, for the planet, something, you know, really revitalizing our agriculture and, and you know, our, our countryside. And actually, if you look very deep into it, you'll figure out that to grow organic and to be able to sell organic, you have to tap in a very specific catalog of, of seed and species that you can actually grow, um, which means that if... if everyone would just, you know, uh, growing organic, biodiversity would just shrink because we can only rely on a certain, you know, very tiny catalog of, of existing uh, species. Um, and so that was something we brought to Carrefour through this fiction that you can see, which looks like a, a real newspaper um, page, uh, but obviously it was a fiction. Uh, and then, you know, from there, they just, you know, start thinking about it and what could be our role as, you know, a, a grocery store or a big retail company in terms of preserving biodiversity. And, and actually, they, they came out six months later with this amazing campaign that you maybe remember called the Black Market Campaign, uh, where basically they were introducing inside their stores um, uh, forbidden seeds, forbidden species that's going to be sell uh, into, into some R4 um, uh, supermarkets. Uh, and so it was a fantastic campaign, a lot, lot of, uh, won a lot of awards, but also that ended up a few years after to a modification of the European law in terms of what, again, what seeds you can use, what, what, what can you use in terms of, um, of, of you know, uh, organic food and, and even non-organic food. Um, so that was one example. The other one I'd like to, to show to you is, is one we've done with Visa. Um, and so basically it was, uh, again, in 2017. And the intention of Visa was trying to figure out, you know, how their industry, how their position could be threatened by other actors and where the disruption could come from because they know very well the current competitors, but they were kind of, you know, trying to guess who can disrupt our business. Um, and so one way to put it is, is that fiction that you can see on the left, which is basically what if we have new currencies, not, you know, about blockchains or new framework, not a new scheme, but really a new currency. And we thought maybe our carbon footprint is going to become a currency because it's going to be something scarce, it's going to be something rare, uh, and it's going to be something that, that one could, you know, spend very carefully. And so we introduced this idea about, you know, what if when you go shopping, you can you know, use two balance, like the money and the carbon footprint at the same time. And, and guess what? Uh, a, f a few months from now uh, ago, a few months ago, uh, Mogo, a startup, a Canadian startup, started with Visa, an offset uh, credit card where basically everything you would purchase, as long as it's, it's responsible, like the more responsible it is, the more cash back you'll get. So really a way to incentivize people um, to, to consume, to, 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 to purchase more responsibly. Um, so those are two examples I just wanted to broach uh, because, like, I think they're pretty easy to understand. And I think another key thing is to f see that, you know, most of the design fiction approach are, are usually leading to, to some very positive innovation, some very, you know, sustainable innovation. 
I think that's also a necessity to come back to my first point about thinking long term and thinking how you can, you know, inside your company create disruptive innovation, but also uh, very, you know, positive and sustainable innovation. So that was pretty much it for me uh, in terms of introducing design fiction. Just want to bring you know a few takeaways of, of those 15 minutes. Uh, first thing is that I encourage you to be a foresight thinker and you know to try to figure out you know every action you're taking today how it's going to have an impact into the future and and really you know think long term. Another thing is is to tell you that design fiction is a framework that helps organizations to anticipate and to build its future. So you want to be proactive. You want to take action. Um, and the last thing is, you know, understand that it's a process is extremely flexible. Again, I said from one hour to six months, uh, very engaging because, you know, everybody cares about the future and, and very creative. Um, that could uh, lead you to, you know, find your new growth drivers, uh, but also figure out the impact of, of today's trends on your business. Uh, and last, gain this confidence into the future, which I think is extremely key um, nowadays. Uh, and so those are those are kind of the key outputs of um, of uh, design fiction. So uh, now I like to to pass the baton to Ron, uh, who will tell you how to an extra layer uh, to to design fiction and to turn those ideas into assets for the future of your companies and really go um, to the, the the next step to make it even more profitable for your company. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I let Ron uh, take over. Um, the, the presentation and, and tell your word about, about himself and about uh, his fantastic job. Okay, great, thank you. And I hope you can see my screen there. Yes, one, we can see your screen, all good. Okay, okay. terrific, thank you, Matthew. Um, that was great and uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, so we uh, have worked with the uh, School Lab uh, on various projects, uh, reinventing storytelling and other um, events here in San Francisco, and we have a common interest in uh, in design fiction and futurism and innovation. Uh, you know, my background is I'm the head of and founder of uh, Headcanon, and we're based in San Francisco, and we are an experienced product and intellectual property development firm. Uh, I have a lot of patents. I'm an inventor myself, uh, and have built products. Uh, for, for quite some time. And relevant to this discussion also, I served for four years as the Global Vice President of Intellectual Property Innovation for Yahoo, uh, which uh, was aimed at um, discovering the uh, inventions, the intellectual property, the products and services that were likely to be strategic to the company or the company's competitors in the foreseeable future. So, we're here to talk about design fiction and Matthew uh, just laid it out perfectly. Um, and we want to add here asset creation for a simple formula that results in industrial strength innovation. So during the process of design fiction and anticipating plausible futures, actually generating real uh, world assets of um, estimable value. So let's talk about how that works. Uh, as Matthew laid out, there are a number of steps that go into the design fiction process. And I won't repeat them. I will say now that what we can do is along the way in a parallel track, turn these ideas almost immediately into assets uh, instead of waiting for multiple months of development. Uh, there is an extension to this notion of creating something which is intangible, but which can also be expressed uh, in, in real world value terms. And so that's IP asset innovation, intellectual property asset innovation. It's formalizing how we think about the ideas that are created during a design fiction process and also prototyping rapidly to surface products, services, and intellectual property, which I'll describe in a second uh, during the process. So what we do in this parallel track is when we're at the stage of innovative concepts, we've got sort of a, a groundwork of what that plausible future might look like and the fiction generation has happened. And now here's some interesting concepts. We pull those into a, 
a parallel side process, which is to classify them. You know, which of these are tactical, addressing near-term issues? Which are strategic, which change the market position for the company and its opportunity? And which are purely defensive? And it doesn't matter when they're executed, but they're designed to protect the uh, revenue assets or market position that already is there. Once you've classified those, we pull the, the, the ones that seem to be the most promising and the ones that are mapped to the greatest value that we can see as a collective uh, team from different disciplines, um, including marketing and finance and, uh, and the innovation team and the product team. But which of those are really should be selected for further processing. And once we do that, there's formal invention disclosures. And that's a formalized way of describing what an idea is uh, in a form that can make it uh, be turned into intellectual property and an asset. Additionally, for those things that are most promising, it may make sense to do prototyping. We are devotees at the headcanon of no-code prototyping. Uh, we have developer capabilities, but we're finding no-code uh, prototyping is dramatically fast. I think it's going to be very important for all of us, really, because it's like uh, visually designing something, but it actually works. Uh, in a serious way. It's componentizing development. So for those things that are important, we do that. Why do we do that? Because we get to see deeper. We get to put testable versions of things in front of people. If in fact, you know, an app uh, versus, you know, something else, uh, which is physical, uh, if it's an app, then, then that's fine. Or a service can be described in that way. And we find more intellectual property. We understand our product better, the market position, and what might follow on. Uh, once we're through that optional step, uh, there is patent development, but there's also other intellectual property involved. If there is patent uh, development, then we assign those to client, a patent pool, or the public domain to dedicate them to the commons. Uh, and then on into next step. These two processes are really the same. This is the virtual product. This is the product and they serve one another and you result in stronger conceptions. And then back into, uh, flowing back into Matthew's next steps, uh, which are to decide what to take forward. So let's step back about intellectual property because not everyone uh, has a sense of its value and some people have an outside sense of its value, but in clear terms, what are a company's assets? If we ask that question, we can look at intellectual property a bit. So typically when we think of a company's assets, uh, we think of their products, uh, the company's brand. Uh, what would Coca-Cola be if it was named uh, Ron Cola? <laughs> it would be sugar water. Um, the people, the services, the market position. In fact, these are all the visible assets of the company and we can see them quite clearly. But there are another set of assets which are equally important that provide foundation, structure, and support for the organization's visible uh, presence. These are intellectual property assets. That includes trade secrets. It's not a patent, it's something you know and you don't want to divulge. And so the creation of those and the management of them is a formal process. Uh, intellectual property rights, if you have somebody sitting in the room with you and designing and inventing something, what happens to the rights? You don't want somebody to come back two weeks later and say, well, actually I own that idea. So the rights and expressing those rights is very important. Trademarks, it's obvious. Uh, copyrights, uh, and of course, patents. All of these are intellectual property assets. So these together constitute, in this view, the totality or at least the broadest view of a company's assets. It doesn't, in our view, make sense to only focus here without equally focusing here because the structures are almost of equivalent strength and importance. So why are these assets important? Well, they preserve the freedom to innovate and operate so that somebody doesn't come along and say, uh, you're invalidating my patent, uh, I have that. I'm sorry, you're, you're uh, infringing my patent. They do strengthen product development if you're thinking in terms of IP at the beginning as opposed to a process of documentation at the end. Um, 
you want to ensure that IP rights are properly assigned, as I, as I mentioned, that they go to the owner or they're shared in some way that makes sense. Uh, and we want to deny bad actors, we call them loose nukes, um, you know, on the marketplace, somebody having a patent that they can chase other companies with, we deny them that. And there's also the potential to see licensing revenue. Uh, there are patent pools for standards, essential uh, inventions, which are hugely important and part of the modern commerce in a, in a global uh, high-tech environment. The bottom line is you want to see a financial return on your innovation and looking at assets is one way to do that. Uh, and developing assets along the way. So here's a question and it relates back to Matthew's uh, discussion about science fiction. How can fiction, um, how can it, you know, uh, affect or how we view the world? This is a 1959 film, a Russian science fiction movie uh, that showed the landing of a rocket ship uh, on, on a platform at sea. And what's interesting is there were only, I guess, eight successful launches at that point. Uh, let's fast forward 60 years to 2016. And here is the landing of the SpaceX uh, booster in an almost identical uh, presentation. So how is it possible that fiction can predict such plausible futures? Uh, and as Matthew said, not everything makes sense. I mean, there are versions of space that we don't even want to think about. But this one was so right on. And there are numerous other ideas, and occasionally we come across them where somebody has predicted the internet or a mobile phone or whatever with startling accuracy. Well, we think it has to do with the framework and uh, that you're working within and what emerges as plausible and even in some cases inevitable innovations. And that starts with world building. Just as if you were building a world, if you were uh, Tolkien or you were George Lucas building Star Wars, you have to think about how, what is this world and how does it work? Uh, what do people do in it? How do they earn? How do they uh, play? How do they travel? How do they love? Um, so you start with a conception of that world. Uh, we can start, for example, in, with uh, the world post-COVID-19. You know, what does that world look like? That's a world where people uh, don't want to touch one another or be in enclosed rooms with one another. So what follows from that? If that's your premise, what happens to travel? What happens to leisure and uh, entertainment, uh, movie theaters? Uh, how do people work? Do they connect in the same way that they used to? Um, you begin to extrapolate in one uh, to the next, the second order and third order, the implications to begin to see a pattern uh, of uh, how this world will work. It is a future history with a lot of reasoned premises that indicate what a plausible future might be. We call this a generative framework. This is a framework from which ideas, inventions, products, and services flow. Uh, and I'll give you an example of the use of that. Back in 2007, we did, we didn't call it design fiction then, we were thinking in terms of uh, futurism and virtual product development, but it's exactly design fiction. We had a program called Yahoo Futurist. Yahoo Futurist, uh, looked at the world, remember this is 2007, uh, the world of 2017. And so on this website, which was internal and accessible to 14,000 people around the world uh, who worked for Yahoo, there was a blog. So every day you would read news and opinions set 10 years in the future, as if it was 10 years in the future. Uh, we hired the Institute for the Future uh, in Palo Alto, uh, a, a very uh, uh, celebrated futurist group, to create scenarios uh, so that we were rooted in these kinds of reasoned extrapolations based on human behavior, the, rises, uh, the rise of technology, uh, and things like that. And then we had videos of important uh, thoughts. Uh, it was a more diverse group than you see here, but it was you know, quite uh, interesting also to pro provide foundation. But it was also 
a working site, not only for immersing yourself into an imagined future, but this was a place where anyone in the company could submit an idea for what a product or service might be that Yahoo would deliver 10 years from now. And then others could vote on that, those ideas. And so it surfaced the best of them, the most plausible ones. And those we took into further development, in some cases prototyping, and in some cases patent filing. The winning uh, submission and the inventors got to uh, have lunch with the founders and got all kinds of awards and things, was something called Yahoo Views. And this is a, a terrible screenshot from the you know primeval time, but it shows a street scene and an overlay uh, that is seen in a set of glasses that are what today we call augmented reality, right? So this is in 2007, you're looking around and you're seeing the restaurants and the reviews and so on, um, that there are different overlays that you could add. Maybe you could, you know, use maps. What are your local merchants? Where, you know, echoing back to the Visa card that, that Matthew mentioned, where are there uh, green uh, merchants where when you shop, you're supporting a green future? How can you tap into your social networks? This is before Facebook's rise. Today, that would be a Facebook link so that you can figure out where your friends were, historical facts and so on. So this was remarkable as an invention then. Uh, what's more remarkable in some ways is that here was the patent drawing from 2008 when we filed it. And these are a set of AR glasses with a start and stop switch. And there's an Apple logo on the side because the group figured, well, a hardware manufacturer would, would create them. And here we are today anticipating the release of Apple's AR glasses with a heads-up display, with an Apple logo on the side, uh, expected in 2021 or 2022. So it's a, remarkable. There are a lot of ways to miss, but there are some ways to hit. And our view is if you have a good generative framework of strong antecedents and premises, you begin to see things that are just inevitable, that feel inevitable. And so those you can sprint forward and, and begin to articulate and capture as assets. And I'll say that what we have decided to do and, uh, and it, it is part of the sort of post-COVID uh, world, but also in collaboration uh, with School Lab and Matthew, uh, is to take that Yahoo futurist model and update it for today. And so we're building, we're deep into development of Headcanon Futurist, which has all the same kind of capabilities, but it is designed to reach uh, either a work group, an innovation team, um, a product group, a division, an entire company, or even an open innovation uh, effort that includes outside contributors from academia or wor wherever to manage that invention process in a a uh, professional way and will include that continuous future history. It's always five years in the future at Headcanon Futures. When you go there, it's 2025. Next year, it'll be 2026 there. And so there is a future history to be written. We are inviting uh, contributors uh, to provide their stories, personal stories, other kinds of stories, news and art, because that is the cultural framework. And again, all written from the perspective of 2025 or five years from whatever future that they're uh, being written in. And there will be the submission of future products, services, and processes, and the voting up or down. There will be a general uh, of these to surface the best of them. Uh, we are building it so that it is general, but also uh, it can be built as a white label for a particular company. So it's company name futurist and available to whomever the company or organization, um, doesn't have to be a, a commercial firm. Any organization that wants to engage can have their own version of this to work with their own people, which also helps people to understand the process of being a uh, forward thinker uh, and a design fictioner, uh, fictionist uh, and an inventor that can address uh, the world uh, and, its, uh, and its evolution. So that is basically it, and uh, thank you for listening.
Thank you very much, Ron. And just to, to, to close this discussion, uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I just want to encourage all of you to be active change maker, rebuilding the future and put your organization into the best position to um, innovate in an offensive way, uh, if I can say. Um, either you are a, you know, head of innovation, an executive, a business unit leader, uh, R&D department or working into public organization, the consultant, whatever I believe, and I think uh, Ron will join me on that point, we are and you are responsible for rebuilding this, this future, and it's for real, it's, it's not fiction, the future is, is not only you know, fiction, it's going to happen. Um, so yeah, I hope this, this message comes through you, and uh, we'd love to be in touch uh, with you if you have any further questions. Um, it has been our great pleasure to, to prepare and to, present, uh, to make this presentation with Ron. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, I, I would like to tell you, please visit us in San Francisco, but it's going to be tough for the next uh, month. <laughs> Virtually. Uh, <laughs> but we'll still be here. Thank you so much, guys. And, uh, and please uh, reach out to us uh, through Minalogic if you have uh, any further questions. And thank you, too. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We're grateful from School Lab presentation on rebuilding the future design fiction and real invention. Uh, so for your consideration, that was a pre-recorded session. So you're welcome to um, to ask for a meeting with Florence Lecuyer, who will be participating on the MBMs. And if you have any further questions, uh, please ask her for a, for a rendezvous, um, for a meeting, and then you will have the occasion to exchange on the specific topic that you're concerned about. So this is all for this session. Um, thank you all for your presentation and uh, have a nice MBM meeting today. Thank you.